Welcome to uh, Barton Peverell's English Literature Department's video lecture on part seven of Rhyme with the Ancient Mariner. This is the final part of Coleridge's anachronistic epic ballad, and uh, it's during this part that perhaps I'd like to talk a little bit more about romantic literature in general at the end. We start uh, part seven with the hermit, which was introduced quite hurriedly at the end of part six, and he, he is a holy figure, which also represents nature. I think that's key. This hermit good lives in that wood, which slopes down to the sea. How loudly his sweet voice he, he, he rears. He loves to talk with mariners that come from a far country. So he loves to talk to sailors. Does he like to counsel them? I think it's not unfair to, to view the hermit as a type of chaplain figure that you would, that you would see in uh, uh, hospitals or prisons, something like that. He kneels at morn and noon and eve, so we can see he's a pious, devout figure. He hath a cushion plump. It is the moss that wholly hides the rotted old oak stump. Now, again, you could look into this visual imagery to offer any number of interpretations, and I'll, I'll give you mine. I think the suggestion here is that if we're describing moss as a cushion, we're describing uh, nature as, as bountiful, as luxurious, as offering all you need. Uh, we're not talking about materialistic, uh, luxurious decadence. What we are talking about is how the natural world can offer comfort, solace, and everything that uh, a hermit would require to live. Now, obviously, um, a hermit is going to be, by definition, minimalistic, but the moral message is that nature can provide, and nature should be the supreme provider in, in human satisfaction. The skiff boat neared, I heard them talk. Why, this is strange, I trow. Where are, there, where are those lights so many and fair that signal made but now? Uh, I think what we've got here is uh, an idea of how uh, eerie and odd this ship would be arriving into the harbour. We've seen the lights of the Seraph men uh, in the previous part in crimson colours. Um, and of course, to the few locals whose job it is to, to greet vessels and moor them up and uh, charge them harbour dues, etc. It would be a, an incredibly uh, splendid sight and, and a very fearful, menacing sight as well. Okay, so again, um, it gives us it's a, the voice is good because it gives um, a point of contact for how odd it would be seeing this ravaged vessel return. Strange, by my faith, the hermit said, and they answered not our cheer. Yes, so unable to speak, unable to communicate, um, because of the the rabbit, you know, because well, the crew are dead, but also the mariner is still still uh, waking up from his trance in many respects. The planks looked warped, and see those sails, how thin they are, and see, I never saw aught like them. I never saw anything like them. So this vessel, I guess, in many ways, readers might picture. Um, mythical uh, vessels like the Mary Celeste and you can certainly see parts of uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean uh, cinema franchise hugely uh, looting this part of the poem for cinematic scenes okay and I never saw aught like to them unless perchance it were brown skeletons of leaves so the hermit the hermit can only understand how awful this vessel looks by putting it in a natural frame of reference. He has to understand it in terms of the natural world. So he describes it in terms of twigs and leaves. Okay, um, Brown skeletons of leaves that lag my forest brook along when the ivy tod is heavy with snow and the owlet whoops of the wolf below that eats the she-wolf's young. So again, I could, the, I've not seen anything like it apart from in the natural world. And we know that the natural world has its own laws, has its own order of things. It is savage and it is barbaric. Um, and we talk about the owlet whooping, and we talk about the consuming the she-wolf's young, how we can see, I've seen horrible, hideous um, things in nature, and that's the only way I can understand this. Dear Lord, it hath a fiendish look, the pilot made reply. So again, the mariner has a fiendish look, bearing the question, is he a fiend? Is he, is he now cursed to be a devil forevermore? But this particularly uh, gothic uh, Lexis is sinister to behold. I am afeard, push on, push on, said the hermit cheerily. The boat came closer to the ship, but I nor spake nor stirred. The boat came close beneath the ship, and straight a sound was heard. So the rowing boat is rowed right up to the bow of the ship. Okay. 
here's an incredible scene of drama which is worth considering when we're right at the end of how the, the ballad is framed. The ship suddenly sinketh. Under the water it rumbled on, still louder and more dread. It reached the ship, it split the bay, the ship went down like lead. Well, lots to discuss in this quatrain on the, at the top of page 21. Um, again, the onomatopoeia of the rumbling, this turbulence, and the vessel is being sucked down. Now, stereotypically, that would suggest, it, is it being sucked down to hell? Is the vessel cursed forevermore? It's being sunk, punished as part of its fall, uh, as its fall from grace, and falling is a quintessential Gothic conceit. Um, and then we talk about it splits the bay. So the, 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 the chasm, the gap in the water, split the bay, but interesting, again, split, division, um, schism of the bay of nature. So this idea of interrupting the natural order of things, it's within the very DNA of, of Coleridge's verse. The ship went down like lead. Well, we've seen things falling like lead when we've seen the albatross fall. So again, it's, it's connecting the two. The crew suggested the mariner was right to kill the albatross and in doing so, made themselves accomplices in the crime. And so the connection of lead falling draws our attention to that together, okay? That they are, that they share the punishment. The punishment is equal, is, is mirrored. Stunned by that loud and dreadful sound which sky and ocean smote. I mean, this is almost biblical language with smote, the idea of punishment, but it's almost the sky and the ocean. The natural world is smiting, is punishing, is judging. Like one that have been seven days drowned, my body lay afloat. So it's floating like a corpse. It's very interesting that the vessel sinks, the mariner's body does not. So the vessel is being dragged to hell, but perhaps the mariner himself is being held for a different purpose, a higher purpose, an alternative existence. But swiftest dreams myself I found within the pilot's boat. Yet he's rescued by humanity, the pilot and the pilot's boy. Even the hermit, if you, you know, if disassociate himself from being a religious figure, is a human being. He's rescued by humanity from the natural world, um, which is uh, something to really consider. Upon the whirl where sank the ship, so the whirl, the whirlpool, um, and we've certainly seen that in cinema. Um, the boat spun round and round, and all was still, save that the sound, the hi save that the hill was telling of the sound. Well, that works in two ways for me. I mean, if we have got this very turbulent natural whirlpool in the middle of a harbour bay, <clears throat> it's going to make a tremendous sound, and so there's going to be echoing um, of this sort of cacophonous sucking down. Um, but it's also perhaps personification of, of nature here. As a narrator, the hill was telling of the sound. Hills, nature, a landscape has a capacity to narrate, has, a, has an ability to um, relate human events and can tell us and it, it give us moral meaning and guidance in a, in a complex world. I moved my lips, the pilot shrieked and fell down in a fit. Now, again, that's presumably because, well, for a number of things. It could be shock and fear that they thought it was a corpse and thought he was dead. It's presumably the mariner has not actually spoken in a long time, so it could have made some kind of hideous growl or gurgle. Um, but the fact that the pilot shrieks and then goes into a, a, a panic fit really suggests the subhuman, abhuman qualities the mariner has. It's, it's, it's like a zombie speaking almost. The holy hermit raised his eyes and prayed where he did sit. So straight away calls for spiritual, supernatural assistance. I took the oars, incredible, so he's exhausted, traumatised, but yet he can still row. The pilot's boy, who now doth crazy go, so I guess you would, uh, as the pilot's boys watched his father scream and then go into a fit, is now likely to panic, okay? So there's a kind of insanity here, a, a lunacy. Um, does that mirror the lunacy of the voyage in the first place? The, the pilot's boy, goes crazy, laughed long, laughed loud and long, and all the while his eyes went to and fro. So again, that's almost fitting as well. Ha ha, quoth he, full plain I see, the devil knows how to row. So the pilot boy assumes that the mariner is the devil, and it perhaps suggests that we know he's done a devilish act. Is he a devil, is he a fiend? Is, you know, has he been consumed by Satan at that moment? Why did he kill the albatross? Was it, you know, and a lot, a big part of 
medieval uh, spirituality and philosophy, which Coleridge is mimicking here, would suggest that it, you know you can be tempted by the devil. The devil can do can take ownership of your actions. It's not you. It's 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 Lucifer you know, possessing you and doing it. And that, in many ways, perhaps explains that one moment of madness. And now, all in my own country, I stood on the firm land. The hermit stepped forth from the boat, and scarcely he could stand. Through fear, through uh, just um, awe at having met the devil. Uh, however, as soon as he gets on the land, he's so pleased to be there. Um, and we often see this, this, this joy of returning to home. Oh, shreve me, shreve me, holy man. The hermit crossed his brow. Yeah. So qu say quick, quoth he, I bid thee say, what manner of man art thou? It's interesting that the, her that the hermit says, what type of man are you? And again, that's, that's the big question for everybody in the poem. What type of man are you? Are you a, a moral man, a good man? Are you an evil sinner? Are you even a man at all? It works in lots of ways. The ancient mariner earnestly entreated the hermit to shrieve him, and the penance of life falls on him. He's asking for forgiveness. So it acts as a confession. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I have, I have killed an albatross. Forthwith, this frame of mine was wrenched with a woeful agony. So again, this in, almost um, sort of spasms of, of hideous pain the mariner is, is racked with. Okay, top of page twenty-two, which forced me to begin my tale, and then it left me free. We're seeing, we're seeing perhaps the first time that the mariner is compelled to tell his story. It acts as this sort of constant cathartic purging exercise where he feels compelled to confess his sins again and again um, because he, he, presumably he believes that in doing so he will personally feel better or that it will have some type of didactic instructive quality and people will learn from his mistakes. Um, next stanza, since then an uncertain hour that agony returns until my ghastly tale is told this heart within me burns. So it's a type of almost uh, moral indigestion, if you will, that he's got this idea that he must tell this story. He's compelled to tell it again and again, cursed to do so. So this, this, this hex, this jinx, where he must tell the story, because in order to warn others, to guide others, and to cleanse his own soul, this constant act of confession, um, ha perhaps has more overtures to sort of to Catholicism in, in some respects. And ever and anon, Throughout his future life, an agony constraineth him to travel from land to land. He must continually wander to tell his story. Um, and this mirrors uh, any type of street preacher or someone with a vocation who must tell their tale. Or indeed an English teacher has to explain his poem year after year. I pass like night from land to land. I have strange power of speech. Well, we've seen that strange power of speech, how commanding it is to the wedding guest. You can hear how the wedding guest can meet a strange man, be put down and miss a wedding, but still be compelled to hear from his voice and his eye and everything else. The whole, the whole characterization package. Um, that moment that his face I see, I know the man that must hear me. To him my tale I teach. So he is an instructor. And it begs the question, why has he stopped the wedding guest? We know he stoppeth one of three. So is the suggestion that... The first one was fine, the second one was not a potential sinner. The third one, you look like you're going to transgress. You look like a, someone that needs moral guidance, a, a new spiritual path. You look like a potential sinner, someone who would commit crimes against nature. So I must tell you the tale. So it, it, the wedding guest on hearing this is clearly going to think, well, you know, goodness me, what, I must mend my ways, or why have you singled me out? Okay. What loud uproar burst from that door? The wedding guests are there, but in the garden bower the bride and bride maid singing are. And hark the little vesper bear which biddeth me to prayer. So now, with the vesper bear, we're talking about evening prayer. So the, the wedding guest has missed the entire wedding, hearing this incredible epic. Um, so compelling is the narrative. O oh, wedding guest, this soul have been alone on a wide, wide sea, so lonely towards that God himself scarce seemed there to be. I was so alone, I thought God had forsaken me. And at times, you know, God was dubiously absent uh, and unable, perhaps deliberately, or unable or unwilling to help the mariner. Um, 
So it can, that's, that's quite ominous, perhaps slightly heretical, I don't know. Oh, sweeter than the marriage feast, tis sweeter far to me to walk together to the kirk with a goodly company. So it's an interesting, interesting uh, division between a marriage, you know, part of the institutions of Christianity. Um, I think perhaps if you focus more on feast, you'll see perhaps more of the difference. It's much better to go to church with good friends, good company, than it is to indulge yourself perhaps at a feast, marriage, wedding feast, or any other type of feast. It's sweeter, it's better. So we keep getting these comparative adjectives towards the end of the poem, which perhaps asking you to com compare your morality with perhaps the morality that's being advocated by Coleridge and the Mariner. To walk together to the kirk and all together pray, while each to his great father bends, old men and babes and loving friends and youths and maidens gay. So we have all generations going to worship and pray. And that is according to the mariner, the sweetest thing. I guess when you look at his voyage, his inability to pray was perhaps the most harrowing thing. Um, because then he could have asked for divine help, but he was unable to do so. So it's no wonder that he views communication with God as one of the most important things in life. I think the line, while each to his great father bends, is it's all embracing. And I think all, all faiths can take that line. Whatever um, faith or belief you have, you, you can bend to it, you can worship it, but, but the whole view is believe in something and respect nature, and whatever, whatever doctrine or dogma you, you believe in, as long as it has some affinity with the natural world, then it is agreeable to the mariner and probably Coleridge by extension. The mention of father is quite interesting because of course a lot of religions have a father figure or, or, or characterise um, their spiritual leader as senior and masculine in that way. Farewell, farewell, but this I tell to thee, thou wedding guest. This is the moral destination of the ballad. He prayeth well who loveth well both man and bird and beast. Okay, so you, you will pray well. You will communicate well with your God. You will have a spiritual poignant connection with your allotted deity if you love man, humanity, your fellow man, human civilization, bird and beast, nature. So you cannot be a good Christian without loving nature. You cannot be a good religious figure without loving nature is what's advocated here. Um, and this has lots of uh, knock-on consequences for how devout Christians treat or devout religious people treat the natural world. Um, a Coleridge would clearly find it unacceptable for you to be a Christian and go fox hunting or something like that, for example. He prayeth best who loveth best all things both great and small. For the dear God who loveth us he made and loveth all. So we are into the realms of all things bright and beautiful. So the all-encompassing. Um, now, Christianity teaches that God is love. Coleridge is going beyond that and saying that, you know, God made everything. God is love. God is love of nature, I would argue. And the final side note says, and to teach by his own example, love and reverence to all things that God made and loveth. Okay. Uh, but it's interesting that we had, the po we had the polar spirit who loved the albatross. So again, we have a plurality of spirituality here, including Christianity, but not exclusive to Christianity. Um, the mariner whose eye is bright, is that bright with hope? for the wedding guest's future prospects now that he's been given this sermon whose beard with age is hoar, hoar frost white is gone and now the wedding guest turned from the bridegroom's door now very interesting simply he's turning away he's turning away and because he's had this moral lesson however just to throw a spanner in the works really you know, perhaps a curveball reading at the end of the ballad this Old man has come and stopped a wedding guest going into a church. He stopped the wedding guest going, entering a religious building and enjoying a wedding. And now he turns from the door of the church. There is some argument and conjecture to suggest that the wedding guest is turning away from Christianity, turning away from obedience, conformity at the end. That's, you know, let, that's unlikely perhaps, but it is certainly slightly alarming structuring here. 
He went like one that had been stunned. Well, we've seen the Mariner almost stunned in his liminal states throughout the ballad, but stunned with, why did, you, why did you tell me the story? Why did you single me out? My goodness, I better mend my ways. And is of sense forlorn. Uh, now, what he, uh, why is he sad? A sadder and a wiser man, he rose the morrow morn. Why is the wedding guest sad? Does he realise that he has been transgressing against the natural world? Is he sad for the ancient mariner? And the fact that the mariner will, is compelled to walk the world for infinity, regurgitating this story to whoever he perceives needs it. Um, but the comparative wiser suggests he has learned, he has learned something, that there is a didactic quality to this sermon, to, to this ballad, um, that it has this quality of education. So he rose the morrow morning, he rises again, is he born again, a, a better person? I think that's probably what Coleridge is getting at. Um, so in that respect, when you look at the overall structuring of the narrative, the wedding guest is, if you take the conventional reading, is better at the end of the poem than he is at the start. So there is a strong argument to suggest that the, the poem is the wedding guest's Bildung's Roman. He has gone on this journey of spiritual development, this journey of self-discovery through the mariner's narration which has educated him. So he has grown, he has developed, you could argue. I think there's a strong case for that. What I would end with, finally, is that what I've been saying is merely my own interpretations of the poem. And I've done a reasonable amount of wider reading, and there are lots of, lots of criticism on Coleridge, which I would encourage you to get hold of. Um, however, it's a cornerstone of what we would consider romantic literature, or romanticism with a capital R. Um, meaning the idea that the imagination is the chief joy of all writing. Imagination and emotion is a far more potent value than reason and logic. So it's perhaps going against um, enlightenment values in many respects by suggesting that, you know, free up your mind, in Coleridge's case through laudanum, but free up your mind to celebrate and make... Um, the natural world accessible to all people by simply enjoying the potency of of pursuing imaginative ideas where they where you will okay and there's a good idea suggesting that you know the rhyme and nature mariner has many interpretations but one is that it is simply coleridge enjoying himself he does mongrelize and bastardize many many different influences the christianity for one the wandering jew we've also discussed However, it is arguable at times that it is simple, simply an indulgence in the imagination and it, an enjoyment in the capacity of human thought to comprehend such plural experiences. Um, and that's why you'll often find the Roman Intermarin taught on romantic literature courses for this advocation of imagination and creativity over logic and reason which, which suggests that anybody that's trying to find a, a logical or empirical solid meaning uh, in in the ballad is perhaps missing the joy of, of the the multitude of interpretations certainly with AO3 you are looking for a variety of interpretations of it and there is not there is just certainly not one solid meaning behind any of it Finally, to conclude, some brief remarks about how the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner might work in your Lit B1 aspects of narrative exam. Now, in the first half of the exam, section A, uh, you're asked in A little a, the first 30 minute uh, question, to focus on one part of the poem. Now, this might make the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner a tempting option in many respects, because there are only seven parts of the ballad, and so there are only seven possible questions that the exam board can ask you, and there will always be, how does Coleridge tell the story in part one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven? Um, so that's very, very doable, okay? Obviously, if you pick it for section A, you would obviously have to do A, little b as well, and that's perhaps where you will decide whether to focus on Coleridge or not, because the debate questions are always going to be um, certainly quite intellectual. Um, and you remember you want to be finding basically two arguments for and one argument against whatever they ask. And all the previous uh, questions on the, the text are, are on Moodle. However, you want to be thinking about key debates within the, the text. Is it religious? Is it a children's poem? Is it a horrific poem? Is it a poem of pure imagination? Is it a condemnation of discovery? 
communication, prayer, um, scenes of violence, all the bizarre imagery. There's lots of things that they could get you to debate. So I think the fact, you know, you might think it's a strength, the fact that you could argue for and against lots of things because of the plurality in the poem would be good. Um, but just remember a little, uh, just remember section A. A little A, you're only assessed on AO2. How does language form and structure help you explain how the story is put together? Well, language should take care of itself if you're just looking at some of the close analysis of the words and phrases. But remember, it is an epic, it is a ballad, and uh, I would advise you to look at the lecture we did on part one to see how we unpick that a little bit more. You know, it would not work if it was a series of sonnets, if it was a series of haikus, or if it was a limerick, you know. The fact is, it's very much the artifice which Coleridge is creating constructs the narrative. And that's re a reasonably sophisticated thing to write about in A Little A. For A Little B, remember, you do need to talk a little bit about context, so a little bit about the romantics, a little bit about the fact that, you know, the turbulence of the late 18th century does is reflected in the poem and the idea of colonialism, conquest, etc. Not too much, but that's that's within the poem. Perhaps a lot of readers uh, and a lot of uh, students choose to focus on the Roman ancient mariner in section B, where you'd be asked to write a couple of paragraphs about how he would use a, a cornerstone of, of narrative teaching. So I think that would work quite nicely. I think if you could say, consider the significance of places, voices, crisis, uh, conflicts, characters, narrators, you can still say you'd have a hell of a lot to write about and you'd only have 20 minutes basically because you'd be writing about three texts in section B you know, to write about that. So I think you, based on these lectures, your class debates and the handouts and research that you've undergone personally, you should have plenty to write about. Thanks for listening.